Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, we recently had an episode of Chef AJ Live where we were asked what does the doctor think about appeal? A-P-E-E-L. It's apparently something that they're putting on fruits and vegetables, maybe to extend shelf life. I know nothing about it. And so I wrote Dr. Juan Rice, who has a regular slot on this show, the um, third Friday, I believe, of every month at 11. It's called The Doctor Is In, where you get to ask him questions because he's not just a doctor. He's actually a farmer. And I thought if anybody knows about this, whether or not it's safe, it would be him. So here he is to answer that question and hopefully a few others please welcome dr ron weiss from the farm hello hello aj of course yeah so um yeah so i recently found out about this appeal and uh took a look at its constituents and uh and you know have a couple of thoughts on it so maybe a little background information on this. Now, appeal is spelled A-P-E-E-L. So um, this product is a coating. It's a, it's a chemical coating that was um, a processed coating that was um, designed to be applied to fresh produce. And the reason why is that, as we all know, when we buy produce, it goes bad fairly quickly, right? I mean, um, and if you think about it, um, think about what happens when that occurs is that um, it contributes to global warming. It is thought that perhaps up to 40% of all the food we buy is wasted in America. And that is a huge contributor to climate change. And, you know, this is a, an acute reminder. I opened up the Times uh, yesterday morning and read that June was the hottest month on record in the, in the history of the planet Earth since we began keeping records in the 1850s. So, and we all know in the Southwest and the South, uh, for weeks, the temperatures have been up above 100 degrees. And food waste is a large contributor to that problem. So uh, from the outset, I'm sure the people who designed this coating to keep produce lasting longer, and you have to remember, it's not just the produce that's wasted from your kitchen. Think about all the produce that, that grocery stores throw out, restaurants throw out, right? Um, uh, institutions throw out because it just doesn't last. So it's a lot of food and that food then outgasses and creates uh, greenhouse gases. So uh, ostensibly, and, and of course, let me add that you know, in food waste, there's a lot of hungry people in the world. And w when we're growing food and it doesn't get to be eaten by those people who are hungry, that's, that's catastrophic. Mm. And especially when you look at our food system, it's the vegetables and fruits that, right, are the healthiest things for people to eat to reverse chronic diseases. So, this company, uh, the Appeal Company, created this process to coat uh, vegetables and fruits on and with, and uh, it acts as like a skin over the fruit, edible, uh, so that the fruit retains its moisture and prevents spoilage for a considerable amount of time. So uh, from the out, from the from the outside looking in, you think, well, that Chef AJ doesn't sound pretty good so far from what I've told you. Look, you could tackle climate change, right? Food waste is terrible. You could help to tackle food insecurity uh, in areas that, that don't have access to fruits and vegetables. 
But here's where the problems lie. First of all, um, when, uh, when I looked at the ingredients of this appeal, the main ingredients are mono and diglycerides. That is a process, those are processed chemical or fats that come from plants. In the United States, they often come from corn uh, and usually GMO corn, although this company says they must use non-GMO corn to do this. Um, and I remember a few years ago, Chef AJ, Dr. Esselstyn, I hope I'm not taking his name in vain. Dr. Esselstyn intoned us, watch out for those uh, monoglycerides and those diglycerides. And the reason why Dr. Esselstyn was saying this is because these compounds are emulsifiers. Have you ever had anyone on your show talking about emulsifiers, Chef Agent? Yeah, you know, I don't know if I've had anybody on the show, but when I hosted the GI Health Summit, I had a lot of GI doctors talking about how like emulsifiers that were in processed foods were very bad for your gut. Really bad. And the reason why they're, and look, at this GI summit, as we all know, it's not just GI, it's for cardiologists, interns, it's just anyone who's a doctor and, and a human and a patient who doesn't want to get sick. The gut microbiome is ground zero of our health, right? So the way the gut microbiome works is you have trillions of organisms in this ecosystem, hopefully healthy, trillions of them. There are more bacteria and microorganisms per square inch in our colon than there are in soil. In, even in the best soils that we have here on our farm, which are regenerative, the human colon beats it out. So you have these trillions of bacteria and other microorganisms which determine ultimately our health. Will we get rheumatoid arthritis? Will we get breast cancer? How much will we weigh? Will we be thin? Will we be overweight? Will we have inflammation in our bodies? Will we get cancer? Will we have heart attacks? All of this stuff is pretty much determined by our gut microbiome. And you have these, this ecosystem, like a forest with millions of different plants and organisms and animals and trees and plants that is living there. That's the uppermost layer. Then you have a layer of mucus. And then beyond the mucus, you have the absorptive surface of the colon through which things enter the body. And that mucus layer is, it's like a, almost like, a, sorry to use this example, but like an Oreo cookie. You know, you have, a, you have that middle layer and then you have the two layers on the outside. And that middle layer of mucus is critical to prevent bad actors from entering over into the absorptive side and also to kind of shield our immune system on that absorptive side because there are a lot of lymphocytes, a hotbed of lymphocytes are immune cells which, which recognize enemies, try to protect us. And that mucus layer protects those uh, immune cells from kind of being overact, overreactive. But emulsifiers, guess what? Which, uh, uh, which are in this product and in oftentimes in dark chocolate, you'll see them anytime you see the term lecithin, like soy lecithin or guar gum or xanthan gum, these kinds of things, they sort of dissolve or, or make miscible uh, mucus and other fats. And they, so they blend together. And we now know that these emulsifiers kind of punch, punch holes and degrade that protective barrier between our, all the organisms and the absorptive surface with the immune system. And then when they come in contact with another, we can have bad things. So emulsifiers are considered processed, highly processed ingredients. And people who are eating whole food, plant-based diets 
should not eat emulsifiers because uh, they have bad effects on your gut microbiome. And so these are the main ingredients of a peel. So here, uh, you know, you think you're doing a good thing eating these vegetables and fruits, um, which are good, but they're they're layered with this these emulsifiers, which degrade, ironically, which degrade your gut microbiome, while the fruits and vegetables are supposed to build your mi mi gut microbiome, right? So they're they're contradictory. Um, so that's the problem with this here. And there are other sorts of problems as well. Um, you know, I, I've been, there's so many ways to think about this appeal, A-P-E-E-L. And by the way, you know, our farm is a, a regenerative organic farm. And that means that we are certified organic by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and by the Real Organic Project, which is the revered organic um, certifier in the far real farmer's world. Um, and regenerative meaning that we restore ecosystems. That's what we do on our farm. We just don't, when we grow food, we're just not growing it for people to eat. We are using the opportunity to restore human health, soil health, planetary health, fix the climate. We regenerate, right? Um, so uh, one of the important aspects of regenerative agriculture is that hopefully it is a local endeavor because you know you don't you don't want to grow things in California uh, and then ship them across the country 3,000 miles uh, to feed people here. That ends up causing a, a whole set of other problems, including worsening climate change. So regenerative organic agriculture, we see its highest level as being local ag agriculture. And so uh, when people come to our farm market here on the farm, this, the foods that they're eating were picked uh, yesterday or today. They were picked within 24 hours of them buying them and consuming them. So our local fresh regenerative produce naturally has a long shelf life. It lasts much longer than the stuff you get in the supermarket. Um, and uh, the other last thing I would add is there is an organic, an OMRI or organic uh, certified version of this appeal, which can be used on um, organic produce. This kind of scary part is you will not know if this is added to your produce. I'm assuming. I don't think that produce has to have a label. I, I doubt it highly that this you would be consuming this. And if you're a high level eater of eating produce, which is what we try to do a lot of, right? If you're plant-based, um, you you're you're trying to read labels and avoid getting these emulsifiers, but now for the first time, you won't be able to avoid them anymore. And I know that would make Dr. Esselstyn very unhappy. Can it be washed off? Some of the viewers are asking. Well, you know, there it's like a skin. <laughs> it's it's supposed to mirror the cuticle. So, you know, I I'm a botanist by training. That's what I got my degree in from college. A cuticle is like a wax. It's hard to, it, it is a wax that is on the outer surface of every leaf, of every apple, of every blueberry. And the purpose of this cuticle is not to wash off, right? So that when rain comes, you the, the fruit or the vegetable retains its protective wax coating. So I don't think it's going to be, you know, very easy to wash off. Wow. How are, they, how are they allowed to do things like this? That they, I mean, did Crazy, they, right? I, was it tested? Were these chemicals tested? Uh, you know, I, I'm guessing they had to do something to satisfy the USDA organic standards. One of the things, uh, when I went to the website, guess what they talk about? How safe they are because they're already used like in coconut oil. They're always already used in baked goods. And, and uh, that you buy in the supermarket, right? All these processed foods. 
So probably when they showed the USDA this, that, well, people eat these all the time anyway, they, it probably went a long way towards getting them uh, passed. However, you have to remember the organic certifiers of the USDA or even the USDA regarding non-organic uh, certification, they could care less about processed foods, right? And I know for all of the listeners who are not familiar, I know Chef AJ wrote a book, which is one of our patients' favorites called Unprocessed. This is the opposite. It's highly processed. And then you're coating something completely pure and unprocessed with it, which is what's so disturbing about it. It's just amazing that things are allowed to happen in, 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 without being questioned. And Aaron is saying, well, what can we do to avoid it? And, and can we avoid it? I mean, I guess we could all grow our own food, but that's not necessarily well, feasible for everyone. What? It's, it's what I always tell people. You should go find a good farmer who's near you. And you walk up to this farmer and you say to her or him, you say, what, what are your methods of growing? You know, this farmer, you know, there, there are um, there are farmers markets pretty much everywhere now. I mean, I know every almost every town in, in New Jersey has a farmer's market. Um, and you should support that local farmer because if they are certified with the real organic project if they are ethical and they have they have these high ideals of growing methods and if they're regenerative they will not use this and they'll invite you to come see their farm because they're proud to show you all the hard work they're doing wow i, I just will it be labeled though that it has it like will we be you able know to it's it's tough it, you know being a doctor and being a Farmer, I feel very violated or very offended by this, but it's it's like things in life are complicated, AJ, right? Like if you think what is our biggest problem in life, it's that June was the hottest month on the planet Earth that we ever know of. And so if if 40% of all of our food is wasted and causing you know CO2 to go into the air and methane, you figure well, maybe it's more important that we eat emulsifiers and then try to decrease CO2 levels in the planet and give people food that have nothing. But it's a, it's hard. And I especially don't like it that we don't know this, that you don't have a choice now. Yeah, that's the thing. We don't have a say. It's just like with GMOs, whether they're good or bad, and I'm sure you can speak to that. It's like the consumer doesn't have a say. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, um, you you know, you, you still you're a regular doctor too. There's a couple of questions that came in about doctory stuff. Would you want to maybe answer those as well? Please. Okay, thank you. This is from Anonymous. I have PCOS. I'm in my mid 40s and was wondering if you'd share your input on my fasting insulin levels and inflammatory markers. Her fasting insulin is 15.1 and her HGA1C is 5. Point two CRP three. She follows the whole food plant based, no SOS diet, or at least no sugar and no oil. Is she on the? Is she on your chat? She's not. This was sent in in advance. Okay. Well, she says her fasting glucose level has been creeping up, and it's now in the nineties. Yeah. Well, let me start by saying, first of all, <laughs> whole food plant based eating. Is pretty good. It, it, it's the surest thing or the closest thing to a cure that I know of. But you know, there's no perfect paradigm on the planet Earth in our world. No, no one or nothing is perfect. So let me start off by saying, you know, the suggestions I, I give and the comments I make are based on my general uh, experience and practice. Um, and that is, that PCOS, otherwise known as polycystic ovary syndrome, is a basically, for most people, a curable condition. Um, uh, or a, a condition that can be, be put into remission. If a diet of whole plant foods is 
followed and exercise lifestyle medicine altogether if they're followed to a high level. So to our audience members who don't know what PCOS is, it's a syndrome that includes elevation, it occurs in women, um, elevation of, um, and usually most of these characteristics are present, elevation of testosterone levels. Now that may shock you, what do you mean? You're a woman, why do you have testosterone? Women have testosterone too. You know, most of it comes from the adrenal gland, but um, women have it too. Um, much more estrogen. Uh, and by the way, men have a little estrogen too. So both sexes have both hormones, but what happens in this condition is the testosterone rises higher than the allowed you know, reference range. What else happens? Usually uh, obesity or overweight is a, a characteristic. Hirsutism, hair growth, um, uh, on the, like, for example, on the face. Um, acne, irregular periods, infertility. All of these things are, are, are gathered together in this basket. Oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot the most, you know, the, the, the element that gives PCOS its name, and that is ovaries, uh, cysts of the ovaries. So, so all of these things are gathered together into the syndrome. And I think the criteria are is you have to have a certain number of them, like three or four of them in order to qualify. So, you know, I, I don't really, you know, I've met people with normal hemoglobin A1Cs who have PCOS. I've, you know, uh, usually people have increased testosterone levels uh, and they have one of these other characteristics, but I'm not a big numbers chaser with this. What I would recommend this young lady do is try to look at the physical characteristics of, of her condition. Like for example, um, it is very, very unusual for a person to have PCOS who is thin or of a normal weight. Um, not impossible, but it is unusual. So. Um, if this young lady has any excess weight on her, I would recommend losing that. And that can be done with a high level whole food plant-based diet. It can be done by, you know, making yourself less insulin resistant by pushing more of your calories towards the beginning of the day, you know, eat like a a queen in the morning, a princess in the afternoon, and a pauper in the evening before six o'clock, uh, because we become more insulin resistant as the evening comes. And it doesn't matter what you eat. You could eat a bowl of kale steamed at eight o'clock at night. You're, you're becoming more insulin resistant even with that. And uh, I'm sorry, I probably forgot to mention that insulin resistance is a key characteristic of PCOS. So um, I think doing that, and of course, so what is uh, lifestyle, the other besides eating whole plant foods, what do the other lifestyle components have to do with helping PCOS? Well, you know, the timing of the eating, you know, you want to put it, as I said before, six o'clock, so you don't become insulin resistant. Mm. Getting making sure your sleep is restorative. That's lifestyle medicine, because if it's not restorative and you have sleep disturbances, you become insulin resistant during the night. And then, you, you know, you have to put out more insulin, which would give you higher insulin levels in the morning. Um, exercise. Uh, exercise helps lower insulin re resistance. Um, so those are my suggestions for this young lady. And, it, you know, with adherence to these principles, usually you can overcome the problem. Thank you. 
Actually, she didn't mention if she struggled with excess weight or not, but hopefully she'll watch this. And uh, if she yes. has questions, she can write back. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, who's watching live, says she has high CRP level for inflammation and no one can figure that out. I'm How sorry, high, say it again. CRP level for inflammation. Yeah. No one can figure out why. How can she reduce that marker? Is there another can, test? Can you ask her, is that cardiac CRP or quantitative CRP? Good question, and, Elizabeth. And, and while we're chat, while I'm talking, maybe you can ask her why it was gotten in the first place. So yeah. C-reactive proteins uh, are, it's a, it's a blood test. It's a, it's a, it's something that you can check in the blood that is a very reactive protein. And it's, it's, it's elevated in situations of inflammation. There are two different, generally, two different kinds of C-reactive protein. We'll call it CRP. There's a kind of a rheumatologic kind of C CRP, which is called quantitative CRP. And, and we get this for people we're suspecting has some kind of autoimmune problem. So that's why I'm asking you, why was it gotten? We get it for people who are wondering about if they have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or giant cell arteritis, stuff like that. Then, so I don't usually get that very often, only if I'm wondering whether a person has these autoimmune conditions. And then the, the test I get very often is called the cardiac CRP. Another name for it is high sensitivity CRP. And that is measure, that measurement of CRP measures inflammation on a completely different scale. I see the, the, the quantitative CRP is like a gross measurement of inflammation. And the cardiac CRP is a very subtle tool to measure subtle amounts of inflammation that are flying below the radar in the average person. The average person who has no complaints, um, it would be kind of unusual to get an elevated quantitative CRP. But I've noticed, when because we get quantitative, uh, the cardiac CRPs routinely in our practice, because we want predictive, um, predictive tests to see whether someone's at risk of getting a heart attack and stroke. And that's what the cardiac CRP does it can accurately give the associated risk of cardiovascular events, heart attacks and strokes during your entire lifetime. That's why we find it so valuable. So um, that's why I'm asking, which one is it? Okay, well, hopefully she is watching the chat and she's gonna answer. Oh, she's saying it's systemic inflammation and my heart stress test is unknown. Well, systemic doesn't tell us whether it's quantitative or cardiac, yeah. uh, but I'm getting a little suspicious that she said her heart stress test, she doesn't know what it shows because that would link to cardiac CRP. Like you wouldn't want to do a cardiac. The, main, the thing that she's wondering, someone must have told her to get a stress test. That would have to do with cardiac risk. The quantitative CRP, that has to do with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, things like that. We're not really primarily concerned with cardiac stress tests for those. So um, for either one, the answer is eat a high level whole food plant-based diet because I never, we have people coming in all the time with these elevated. And within one year of um, them, the patients buckling down, I don't remember it ever not becoming low. It becomes low risk and low range of, of the, for the value. So that's what I would suggest. Eat, eat a diet of whole plant foods, high level. Great. No, no, no processed, right? No emulsifiers. Read Chef AJ's book, Unprocessed. You want to eat that. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. It's actually on sale now. So this next question from Anne is very important to me because it's about 
atrial fibrillation and a dear friend of mine who you may know, but I'm not going to mention here, just had a massive stroke due to atrial fibrillation. And so her question is, what can be done to reverse it? And she writes ablation cardioversion. I am newly diagnosed with this uh, fibrillation, constant AFib, feeling no symptoms though. She's a 76-year-old female, whole food plant-based, SOS, most, SOS free mostly for the last five years. She was just put on Eliquis to prevent blood clots. And her new cardiologist said to take Eliquis and come back in a year unless the symptoms stop bothering me. Well, I don't want to wait a year. Is it harder for a procedure to work and to get back into normal atrial functioning the longer you have AFib? My blood pressure pulse work is all very good. Weight is 150 at five foot seven, active person enjoying life. Um, she's seeing an electrophysiologist in a few weeks to get more information. Yeah. Hmm. So a little background on atrial fibrillation. It, this, this, um, your heart has a pacemaker in it. And I, uh, this pacemaker, you know, I'm a musician. So I liken this pacemaker to the conductor of an orchestra. It, it conducts the heart and tells it when to beat. At every moment, every beat, it, it conducts and sends an electrical impulse from the SA node, which is the conductor. It's an electrical sort of starter in your heart and tells your heart to beat on cue, like on the conductor's cue. And what happens in atrial fibrillation, there are all kinds of upstarts in the orchestra, which start sending their, you know, they're not listening to the conductor. They start sending, you know, electrical impulses and... You know, you have chaos. You have beats coming from everywhere. You know, they're instead of a regular beat, it can be very, it's usually very irregular. It can be, uh, a lot of the time it gets to be too rapid. The rate is not controlled oftentimes. So, you know, um, it's a problem. And for reasons that are not clear, the incidence of this has dramatically increased since I was a medical student, Chef AJ, as have many diseases. Hmm, wonder what that has to do with. So um, we don't exactly know why, but I strongly suspect it may have something to do with environmental pollutants and food, but don't, I cannot prove that to you, but I suspect those are the, those are the two great things that have changed over our lifetime. Uh, if you're like 60, 50, 60 years old, they've dramatically changed. So um, when you go to Dr. Greger's website and you look up atrial fibrillation, um, there seems to be maybe some food influences, like, um, for example, there's there is a I remember there is a um, there he has one uh, video that talks about eating darkly colored fish. Um, you know, darkly colored fish have a lot of fish oils in them, and fish oils have a lot of environmental pollutants in them, endocrine disruptors, carcinogens, things like that. Maybe it has something to do with that, mm. as I said. Um, I know that, uh, you know, I went to medical school at New Jersey Medical School in Newark. And when I was there, there was a professor who discovered the holiday heart syndrome. And I remember he taught me. Uh, I'm trying to remember his name now. I'll have to. It's long ago. I'm not sure I can remember it. Guess what the holiday heart syndrome is? People who are not uh, alcohol al have alcoholic disorder uh, will all of a sudden on a party or a holiday tie one on and drink a lot of alcohol, like it's a holiday, and then they end up in the emergency room with atrial fibrillation the next day. So we know that alcohol does have some kind of effect. So. The only things that I, I can tell you are those kinds of effects. There are other things that are irritants to the heart, like maybe, well, we know caffeine probably is an irritant or decongestants. So, 
but it's kind of vague. Uh, don't know why we're, I can't definitively tell you why this is really starting to become an epidemic. I know many of my patients turn up having atrial fibrillation, but I think it's because of probably what I told you. Once you get it, I would, I would make sure to stay away from these items because if these items that I just mentioned to you are potentially causes, you don't want to introduce them uh, because they could only potentially intuitively make things worse. Um, be thin, eat whole plant foods, make sure you don't take in chemicals and pesticides and endocrine disruptors and pollutants. Don't drink alcohol, stay away from decongestants. If you're doing all of those, and coffee and alcohol, and you still can't overcome the atrial fibrillation, uh, you've got to take that blood thinner if the doctor has given it to you, because God forbid we have a massive stroke, AJ. That's not something that you want. Like I take people off a lot of medications. That's called deprescribing or medication escalation. I do not. I never take them off blood thinners. Because we know that atrial fibrillation, if you're at risk for having a stroke, and there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a score that the doctor works out for you called a CHADS score that determines if you are at risk for stroke. And if you get a number on the scale that indicates you are, you have to go on the blood thinner. Don't take a chance. The blood thinners work. They prevent strokes. Uh, short of that, uh, yes, I, I would go to an electrophysiologist. That's called an EP doctor. I would and be, you know, an, um, an electrophysiologist, for those who don't know, it's a subspecialty of cardiology and they deal with, they're like the electricians of the heart. They deal with mapping out the electrical circuits. Why is this? Why isn't, uh, why are these irregular beats coming back? up, where can we sort of short circuit them or maybe use a laser or do stuff like that. So, you know, I would be gui guided by the EP specialist. Just be aware that not all of these procedures work. They, they just don't. Uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Yet, based on your specific individual case, you have to ask the EP specialist, hey, if you do this ablation procedure on me, what are the what are my chances? Because there's always a chance you can go back in it. But quite frankly, if I had a, I'm just giving you from my perspective, if I had a reasonable chance of getting out of AFib with the ablation procedure instead of taking blood thinners my lifelong, I think I might try it. Um, however, if it doesn't work or you don't have a, you can't get the ablation procedure or it's, it doesn't, doesn't have a good effectiveness rate, go on the blood thinners. Don't, do not, do not miss them because. Thank you. you, know, you can have devastating effect. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we, we think this person might not have been on them. This is from Dahlia and she asks, my understanding is that some medications will improve lab numbers, but the damage is still being done to the body. For example, meds for high blood pressure, cholesterol, type two diabetes, because of the continuation of the poor diet and lifestyle. Will you explain how this happens? I know people who are lulled into believing everything is good since their labs are okay with meds, but the damage from their diet and lifestyle seems to eventually catch up. It's a very thoughtful question. Yes, that is a very thought and a beautiful question. You know, sometimes we get questions, AJ, because I know you get a lot of questions yourself. You know, you get these beautiful questions. There's questions we get a lot of the same of, but a question like this uh, is a very beautiful question because it ties together uh, a more comprehensive approach to what we do. So let me give you some examples. And I know I only have a couple of minutes left, but you know, uh, again, I'm intoning the name of Dr. McDougall because I remember a video he made many years ago talks about, you brought up the, the um, question asker brought up about the issue about hypertension, 
right? And Dr. McDougal Dougal once made a video about this where, you know, just because you're taking a blood pressure pill and you're lowering, you're forcibly lowering the blood pressure in your pipes, does that really mean that you're getting to the cause of why you had blood high blood pressure? And the answer is no, you are not. The reason why people have high blood pressure are because these arteries, which are supposed to be elastic and flexible, they're like lead pipes. They're all caked up with junk and crap from the diet and, and salt and, and the lack of nitric oxide. And they're very stiff so that when the heart beats every second and forces blood, there's no give, right? There's no expansion of the nice flexible elastic arteries. And so your blood pressure goes up. So you can take blood pressure pills until the cows come home. However, if you keep eating potato chips and you know hamburgers, you'll still have the same inflexible non-compliant arteries. It doesn't matter. And um, so that's a good example. Here's another, you also, I think this lady brought up like cholesterol. Here's another good example of why it doesn't work to take medications. Let's say, uh, you know, statin agents are, are the, probably the most widely prescribed drugs across the population of any medication. And um, so we all know that the reason why people have high cholesterols is, is because of what they eat. They're eating food that causes their cholesterol to go up, and then that damages their vasculature, right? Their arteries and clogs it up. So what does taking Lipitor do? It lowers your cholesterol. So you can still keep eating cheeseburgers and chicken parmesan, chocolate cakes. You still keep eating the same stuff that caused your cholesterol to go up in the first place. Because as Dr. Furman says, it's a permission slip. The, the Lipitor that you get is a permission slip to continue the diet that's causing your diseases. And the sad part about it is, is that you, people will, the general public will take this Lipitor, but they continue eating the foods that will give them diabetes. They continue eating the foods that will give them breast cancer and Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, Lipitor doesn't do anything about that. So the reason why this question is so beautiful is, is this lady gets it. It's by eating whole plant foods, it's a universal truth, right? It, it just addresses everything in our health. Beautiful, yeah. I love it. Thank you so and, much, I know you have to Yeah, I, I do have to go, Chef AG, but I, I did want to, and we can talk about this maybe next month in August. I just did want to remind everyone about Farm Days Festival, which is on the 9th and 10th. It is a mind blowing experience. The, the people who've been to this say they've never been to something like this ever before. It's, it's not just the world's leading lifestyle people. It's not just that you get to meet them, uh, hear them speak, commune with them, but it's in a very special environment here on this 300 year old working regenerative farm. It's very inspirational. This farm is one of the most historic in the nation. We're, we're an hour west of New York City. There's a lot of stuff to do out here. We're right in beautiful Northern New Jersey. Um, uh, this year, we have Peter Singer, the founder of the modern animal rights movement. Um, Rich Roll, um, the team Shirzai, Megan Grega, Columbus Batiste, uh, my friend Bob Quinn, who has an answer for many of us for gluten sensitivity because he, he uh, is the founder of Kamut, an ancient wheat, which, um, uh, which um, most people with gluten sensitivity are, are okay eating. Um, let's see. Oh, and there are others, but um, yeah. It's, it's a fantastic event. Uh, and uh, I believe if you can't make it in here, here in person, 
we will also have a live feed you can attend remotely. So I encourage everyone, please go to our website. It is ethosfarmproject.org. And um, you can find out more and get tickets. That's fantastic. Well, we still can talk about it next month. And once you have the virtual option in place, we can provide links for people to register. Beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. I Thank you, AJ. You. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Dr. Weiss might like tomorrow's episode at nine with Omad Hazwai. I hope I pronounced his name. It's going to be talking about uh, sustainable farming. Take care. Oh, of it. Yeah. I can't wait. Yep.